This right here is the KSO Show. Stay current on everything in the world of K-State basketball and K-State football. We cover everything going inside the two programs. If you want inside information, subscribe to K-State Online and join a message board with fans just like yourself. Now, let's get it. It's the KSO Show. I'm Derek Young. Obviously, as what typically happens, I am joined by Grant Flanders, but also... We have Drew Galloway and Colin Settle. We are in Arlington, Texas. We've already, I mean, it's really come to a close already. Big 12 Media Days. It was a almost like a flash in the pan. It went by really quick. Uh, we'll, we'll begin uh, kind of breaking it down by actually covering every other Big 12 team. What we, what we thought, you know, perhaps the headlines were for, for each institution. We'll begin with West Virginia. And I guess initially, since we're jumping right into it, I'll say it was kind of a night and day performance from Neil Brown, um, obviously, for those that can remember his uh, debut at Big 12 Media Days two years ago. Obviously, we didn't have one last year, so this was the second one, and he was just a kind of a completely different person. The first one, he was really nervous, didn't really look comfortable in his own skin, and uh, just didn't have a great presence or comfort about him in, in, in answering questions. And this time, um, obviously, they went on day one. I thought that he was probably one of the more comfortable coaches at the podium. Um, Had a real grasp of his own roster, whereas probably he didn't in the first go around. So, um, And that just kind of lends itself to me, kind of, that's evidence of what we've seen from them on the field. I I, I think Neil Brown's probably already exceeded expectations in West Virginia to an extent. Um, They've continued their dominance over Kansas State, of course, um, with two more wins. as, uh, Neil Brown's 2-0 and against Chris Kleiman. We'll see what happens in the trilogy between the two. But uh, I, I think the Mountaineers, they were picked sixth, and I would not be surprised. In fact, I would predict they'll probably finish better, and it's because Neil Brown's a lot better coach than I anticipated. I think Neil Brown has got a really good shot to, you know, have a really good season. He's got some really stud players. His running back, you know, he gushed over Letty Brown. Um, and he's a player that's really going to stand out this year for, in the Big 12. And uh, I would just, I would also say that there wasn't many uh, coaches that had bad performances today, but there were a few. And I think, Drew, uh, you would say Matt Wells wasn't your favorite. Yeah, right? Matt Wells was a little un- underperforming for me. But, like, back to Neil Brown, he really gushed about Letty Brown and their defense. I think their defense is going to be one of the better defenses in the league. I mean, specifically just looking at Dante Stills, his brother Darius graduated, those two held down the middle of that defensive line. I think that Dante is really going to be the one to hold this defense down. Because, I mean, they were the top defense in the Big 12, arguably, last season. So, And they brought Dante this week to, to the media days. And with Texas Tech, if we can pivot and go to the Red Raiders, as, as Flando, you know, kind of tried to allude to there, Matt Wells probably – Perhaps, I guess we can kind of debate it a little bit here and use this as the time to do so, might be the only coach on the hot seat in the Big 12 entering the 2021 season. It's hard to foresee anyone else really being on the hot seat. Obviously, it's the first year for Sarkeesian, the first year for Leipold. Mm -hmm. Kleiman has a longer leash in front of him. Matt Campbell's having success. Um, Gary Patterson's not going anywhere. Dave Aranda's fairly new. Mike Gundy's not going anywhere. Lincoln Riley, obviously, not going anywhere. So I, I think this is probably a case where Matt Wells is probably the only coach in the Big 12 that doesn't really feel comfortable within his own contract. And, and the fact that they're, they're picked ninth, and I think that was a fair prediction mm-hmm. to have them ninth, mm-hmm. I think they are the clear ninth place team, means you know there's probably some rocky times ahead in Lubbock. I mean, I think it all started, too, when their quarterback decided to go to Michigan and transfer from the school. Because now, I mean, te- Texas Tech isn't the only one with this problem. But uh, Matt Wells is the only one in the Big 12 on, possibly on the hot seat. And they have a quarterback issue in Lubbock, as a lot of Big 12 teams do. We don't know who's playing at some of these places, but it'll be interesting to see uh, what the Red Raiders trot out with. Under and, I, and I don't know that I would call it a quarterback problem. Maybe a little uncertainty. I think Tyler Show is definitely going to be the guy. He's on NFL draft list at this point. He's the transfer from Oregon that they have. And, I, you know, to put it blunt, Matt Wells is hoping that guy saves his job. <laughs> you better. They're in a weird spot, too, roster-wise, because they took 18 transfers last cycle and only 12 high school players, so they're kind of in a weird spot. And if Matt Wells does get fired, they're in a really weird spot. 
for the next coach. Yeah, with 18 transfers. The fact that there was only 12 high schoolers, though, that helps them in terms of counters a little bit. I imagine some of those transfers were likely of the blue shirt variety. Uh, let's move on to Iowa State. Obviously picked second to win the Big 12. Um, and, and we'll put it put it simply, I mean, it's not a surprise, but Matt, Matt Campbell is very impressive when he's on the podium and addressing the media. He's the best one there is. I mean, you see the way he addresses the media and uh, talks about his team. It's all class every single time he talks, but also swagger. He has that in him, um, and that's what makes him just such a good coach and so successful, um, and that's why it sucks for a lot of K-State fans out here to see you guys so successful in Ames um, and still not get gobbled up somewhere else. Yeah, and he's very charismatic, and, and he definitely even leaned into the star power that he does have on his team. Mike Rose, I think, is picked – to be the defensive player of the year, Brees Hall's on a Heisman list, and Brock mm-hmm. Purdy could give Spencer Rattler a run for his money in terms of being the first team All Big 12 quarterback. Yeah, I was really impressed with Matt Campbell. I said when he was over that I would run through a brick wall for him. <laughs> He's so charismatic, mm-hmm. and you can tell that he really cares about a lot of his players. He gushed over Brees Hall for about five minutes as well. And then we. Well, might as well touch on the Kansas Jayhawks. They actually didn't make it to Arlington <laughs> because of travel complications, yeah. and and they still had to kind of go back a year almost in mm-hmm. terms of it was virtual all over again when we uh, heard from Lance Leipold. Um, probably not the most charismatic guy, but still you could tell he was calculated and prepared. It. And definitely, and if you and you know for Jayhawk fans, he's probably a breath of fresh air compared to what. You know, they saw and heard often in the media setting from Les Miles, which was, you know, pretty, you know, a discombobulated mess at times, very unorganized and, and you know, disruptive. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think he's a good coach. We'll find out soon enough, obviously, but he's got a huge hole to dig himself out of. I think he's a good coach, but yeah, it's like you just said, it's, this is a way bigger animal than really any other Power Five program in the country because. You're talking about a team that's really, you know, in shambles. After Les Miles, I mean, even Beatty, it wasn't great, and then Les Miles took it even to deeper depths. And I mean, Leipold's a great option, great hire here. But, yeah, um, they, I mean, this might be the one to give a guy a few more years, too, even if he doesn't perform right away, because I think he has it in him. But also, um, it's going to make it difficult for K-State again. Uh, battling against a guy recruiting-wise in the state. To get the amount of time that he's going to need to do what he wants to do at Kansas, they're (laughs) going to have to be patient, but he's also going to have to show them signs of life a Mm -hmm. little bit, some, you know, promising signs. Is that a Mm -hmm. win in the Big 12 in year one? It might be, but that's going to be tough. I just don't know where they'll get a win in the Big 12 unless, you know, there's a Unless if, if Texas Tech's quarterback Tyler Show is not the NFL draft prospect that some think he is, then that's the only potential win I could see for them in Big Twelve play. But for Kansas, mm-hmm. it probably starts and ends with that. I mean, their their offensive line is still a disaster, to put it lightly, and they have no solution at quarterback yet. And that's just what I was going to say. You're looking at Jalen Daniel, Daniels and uh, Miles Kendrick, and I don't Kendrick really I think struggled at times. You know, got banged up here and there. Last season, um, and Jalen Daniels doesn't know how to throw the football, but he's a good athlete and he can he can really run the ball. But um, they do have North Texas, uh, J- I think it's Jason Bean coming in, um, which could be someone that tries to take the spot there because I I don't think Kendrick and Daniels necessarily have this thing locked down, even though they were the two quarterbacks that got the the go last season. I will say, all things considered, Leipold was pretty good with having a virtual press conference is yeah. being the only person having to do that. He still commanded the room pretty well. He was dialed in. He The only real awkward part was that there was a, like a two or three minute stretch where he couldn't hear anything else. So they had to stop a little bit. But other than that, he did really well for the situation that he was given. Oklahoma Sooners is always considered the favorites of the Big 12. Um, probably just leave this question up to the group. Uh, I think we all picked them to get first in the league again. But do you see them winning the Big 12? For, would it be the seventh year in a row? Seventh year seventh in a row. Seventh year. Do they make it seven in a row? I I think they do. There, there's even some chatter, um, some in the know that believe this could be Lincoln Riley's best team that he's had in Norman. I believe it. I, and I think, you know, on top of that, Lincoln Riley is a really damn good coach. I, I think that's, you know, 
and so is Matt Campbell. So you're looking at two really good options, but I think at the end of the day, I like what Oklahoma has. Um, and Spencer Rattler over Brock Purdy is really what it comes down to. Is Rattler is just, you know, I think slightly more dynamic. You know, last year he showed that he, um, as a freshman, had times where he struggled, but also was really, really good at times as well. So I think in a year two he could really show out. Whereas Brock Purdy, we haven't seen, like, peak potential of what, we kind of have had thoughts of what he could be in the future. Yeah, freshman year Brock Purdy was better than the Brock Purdy yes. last year. But I, I think that this is Oklahoma's most complete team. I'm mm-hmm. not sure if this is their most talented team, but I think it's the most complete. And their defense, surprisingly, I think could be really good. Yeah, there's a there's few good defenses in Big 12. I, yeah. I know some coaches have said it, and I, I, I kind of like shook my head at it. I was like, this is not a defensive league because it, it really isn't. But Oklahoma State going to have a quality defense. That'll be the team we talk about next. Oklahoma's going to have a quality defense. Iowa State certainly mm-hmm. has a pretty good defense. West Virginia has a really good defense. There are This is kind of a defensive year almost in the Big 12. I think there will still be a lot of points. Don't get me wrong, because that's just the era of college football or football together that we yeah. are in. You turn on Saturdays and Sundays in the fall anymore, and if there's not one team in the game that isn't scoring at least 30, it's probably a bit of a surprise. That's just the times that we are in. But I guess relative to what – we see now year in and year out, I think there'll be more good defenses in the league. And the yeah. Sooners are certainly reflective of that, what will help them as well. It is, I, th- I think they were a little underwhelmed by what they got out of the back their backfield last year. I think it certainly wasn't bad, but I don't think it was what they wanted it to be. And they can kind of return to form there since Kennedy Brooks is back. He opted out. Some A lot of players that hopped out didn't come back. Um, the only one for Kansas State who really came back was a running back as well, and Joe Irvin. Mm-hmm. Oklahoma got Kennedy Brooks back, and that's probably no small thing. And I think, yeah, I think he's one of the better backs in the league right away. No, yeah, and I mean, just circling back to Spencer Rather, I think he's probably the player that I'm most excited to see this upcoming season, just all of the hype around him. Is he going to be that guy that's going to, you know, possibly win yet another Heisman for mm-hmm. an Oklahoma quarterback? No, so that would be... That would be wild. He's he's certainly. I mean, he's probably the best candidate out of the Big Twelve. I know that some people want to allude to Brees Hall, but it's usually more state going Deuce with Hall, or Deuce Vaughn. Deuce, oh, Deuce Vaughn, yeah. <laughs> especially if he gets those thirty touches yeah. a game. But uh, uh, no, I. You, uh-huh. It's always safer to go with a quarterback. So Spencer yeah. Rattler's probably mm-hmm. that dude. Uh, Oklahoma State, I'm a bad quarterback either. Probably the most athletic yeah. quarterback in yeah. the league in Spencer Sanders, but. Spencer Sanders will keep Oklahoma State in a lot of games. He'll also keep the opponent in a lot of games because he's very turnover prone, very mistake prone. Mm-hmm. I guess do we see him clean that up? Do they? Does he? Because so. Oklahoma State will they have a chance to win ten games, but it'll only happen as Spencer Sanders cleans up that part of his game. It raises a bunch of questions. Uh, you know, was he taking more chances because he had a guy like Tylen Wallace, you know, to throw to? And now, you know, maybe he is going to be more calculated, or actually now be pretty, safer, or, 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 or yeah. he might have to take more chances now that he doesn't exactly have Tylen because Wallace. Tylen Wallace could, would catch anything. <laughs> <laughs> he but, certainly yeah. would. Yeah. I, it's going to be a little bit of a backwards year for Oklahoma State. We just talked about the defenses. It's very possible that their defense will be better than their offense. Yeah, yeah. Um, but back back to Sanders. Uh, I'm pretty sure Gundy said that this is the most progress that he's seen Sanders make since he's been there. So mm-hmm. maybe he's a little bit better. But he's so mistake prone yeah. and kind of gets banged up every now and then. I'll believe it when I see it with him. I just I have a hard time buying into Spencer Sanders. I love their defense though. I do too, and I think they showed they didn't they bench Sanders for Illingsworth at times last year. Yeah, I think they, that they, happened they, because yeah. he was that mistake prone, and it's not like Illingsworth. Uh, uh, Spencer Rattler got benched last year too. Yeah, to be fair. He, that is a good point. <laughs> that is a good point. But that was Spencer Sanders' second year under center, right? Um, you know, so it's it's tough. But Oklahoma will be able to ride on their defense. He also talked about how it's the fastest defense he's had since he's been at Oklahoma State, which is how long for Gundy mm-hmm. now? Um, so seventeen years. Yeah. 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 But, yeah, no, it's like you said, um, the defenses are all about the Big 12 this year. Arnada, I mean, we could talk about Baylor at some point, but Arnada brought that up, how this is where the league is going. It's all defense, um, not all defense, but he's talked about how Tech's one of the few teams that will spread you wide, whereas everyone else is kind of going to more defensive-oriented teams. Yeah, I mean, we, we go with Baylor next. Dave Aranda, obviously, Aranda. We, heard, we, heard <laughs> him, that one. we heard him for the first time since last year was his first year as head yeah. coach, but obviously there wasn't a media days in Arlington due to COVID-19. Uh, he's a little bit more 
I guess, reserved in terms of his presentation yeah. and how he, Very how he yeah, yeah, how he handles yeah. himself. Kind of an more of an intellectual uh-huh. type when he, um, you know, is exchanging dialogue with the media. He wasn't really revealing about his roster. He kind of left it all still to be quite a mystery. I don't even think that. I mean, the, the, the problem with Baylor is that he, they have a chance to make a considerable jump in terms of how good they are or how much they are going to move forward as a program because they did everything last year virtually, trying to instill their entire offense installation culture everything first year they did it all with a brand new coach but they couldn't be in person that had to be the most complicated and difficult thing to ever do like they they literally tried to restart a program without being in person Mm -hmm. and i I can't imagine the difficulties and complications that are associated with that um but we go to year two because they have all that they have an actual off season that has a little bit of normalcy to it i could see baylor taking a pretty big step forward towards the progress and development the only the only problem the only scary thing if you're a Bears fan would be like there's a big hole at quarterback for them yeah. as well as mm-hmm. Charlie Charlie Brewer's gone and there's no clear cut answer Jacob Zeno has played a little bit but it hasn't been good no yeah there's concerns for in Waco for sure especially under center like you said but I also wasn't always sold on Brewer so maybe a fresh perspective someone different does show us that oh they could throw a more dynamic quarterback out there but. Brewer was dynamic, but sometimes he just missed throws, you know. Yeah, yeah he was pretty injury prone too. Yeah, that too. Uh, but Aranda, I thought, started kind of nervous and then got real better about answering questions and not kind of sounding like a robot mm-hmm. near the end and got a lot more comfortable. But he just really didn't say anything yeah. of, like, substance. No. Not about his team specifically. But he did talk a lot about football, but just about other teams and stuff. And, like, he talked about spread offenses and and talked about how the defense was getting, you know. It was more philosophical. Yeah, more and philosophical. Yeah. And philosophical in nature. Mm-hmm. I would, they're going to have to rely on their defense quite a bit, which I anticipate them having a decent defense, too. Dave Aran is one of the more brilliant defensive minds in all of college football. I mean, he engineered LSU's defense for a number of years and, and all those secondaries that were elite and sent players to the league nearly every year in the first round. That was because of Aranda, mm-hmm. and, and I think it almost went back to his days at Wisconsin as well. So he has a pretty large pedigree in, in that regard. Two teams left. We'll go to the other private school in the league, which is TCU. Gary Patterson, just like Mike Gundy, he's been at you know in Fort Worth for quite a bit. Um, it's almost for me kind of like how I feel about Spencer Sanders, where I just you know I have a hard time having trust in it, have a hard time believing in it. I've lost a lot of faith and belief in Gary Patterson as a head coach the last few years just because it's kind of gotten a little sloppy almost at times and, and it leaves you scratching your head a mm-hmm. number of times mm-hmm. inside games when, when you see the Horn Frogs play, whether it be on TV or in person. But with that being said, this could be the year maybe he returns to form a little bit, gets over that hump because – Probably not a bold prediction, but they might have the second most talented roster in the entire Big 12 um, after Oklahoma. And yes, that means more than Texas. Steve Sarkeesian is going to have Texas really talented because he can really recruit and he knows what he wants in terms of a lot of different things, especially mm-hmm. in offense. And he just got done at the Nick Saban School of Coaching, of course. But I, for, for just this year, I, I do think TCU probably has more talent than Texas. Patterson has definitely been a little sloppier the past few years, especially, you know, compared to a guy like Gundy. You know, they've been in the league forever. Gundy, you know, he's had really talented teams too and not, you know, taking them to the top. But this would be a year where Patterson could really cement himself and, you know, make him, um, you know, make it seem like he could be back instead of on his way out. Uh, Gary Patterson probably is more recent, like, huge years i guess with the 10 or 11 win seasons all those gundy yeah, has they the, had those, yeah. gundy had them too I, I think gary patterson he's been to it well, was back in the day it was the bcs bulls mm-hmm, they went mm-hmm. to the rose bulls and stuff of like that but i i guess the real difference between those two is the like gary, gary patterson has the, those highest of highs maybe just a little bit hair more than gundy mm-hmm. but his, his lows, lows are, his are lows are a lot more problematic too like mike gundy's real bad year is probably seven to five yeah um, and but he'll have nine or and ten win teams mixed mm-hmm. in there. Garrett Passion's go, he goes from eleven wins to four wins. To, to, yeah. to, to, it's a very roller coaster type of career that he's had in the probably the last six or seven years. Well, we've talked about how TCU has had like some culture issues, and Patterson was pretty high on the team's culture and said it was one of the best that they've had in a long time. So maybe with a better locker room, they could turn it around. But I just 
we'll wait and see because I don't really believe in Max Duggan. Yeah, their best years have had under Gary Patterson are when they have really good quarterback play. I think Max Max Duggan can be a good quarterback. Is he good enough? That that's it's it's really fifty fifty to me because I think he's good, but is is he? I, I, it's almost like he's a hair short. No, it's like you said. Like this team has the second best roster in the league, but it's not because of Max Duggan. We're, like it's. He's not the reason we're saying like he's he's a, a solid player, um, but he's not a Trayvon Boykin. Like he's not the pl- the player that they need in that TCU offense. I would agree, but it's funny too because when you when you say that though, I do remember the game. <laughs> was it 2018 when or 19 where he actually ran all over Kansas State? Oh yeah, and, 2019. And yeah. yeah, I mean he had he had over 100 yards that game on the ground. He may have. He yeah, he broke up like an 80-yard touchdown run. Yeah, it so ridiculous. it's funny we're talking about that, but he actually put it to Kansas State in Manhattan. <laughs> and, you know, I think that, uh, was that as a backup, too? No, he started okay, He started, started as a true freshman. And, you know, I think he should get some more credit, too, because he came back from, like, almost a life-threatening thing, didn't he? Like, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, from he, last season. He missed struggled, all last but season. But, man, you came back from all something off-season. that people thought you weren't going to come back and play football at all. No, you know, it's a great story. Yeah. And for him to have a – if he were to get over that hump and, you know, maybe do what Brock Purdy did a year ago, yeah. then, you know, it would be the ultimate – almost of a comeback story of sorts, even though he didn't actually end up missing – I don't think he actually ended up missing a game from it. The last non-Kent State school to probably cover, and then we'll jump deep dive into, into the Wildcats – New head coach in Austin. Um, they get a new head coach every three years, it seems yeah. like. Steve Sarkeesian is at the controls now. Mm-hmm. Um, what is our, I guess, thoughts, beliefs, our faith system, and what he's going to do? I have, I have a feeling he knows he's got a pretty good plan. He's going to carry it out well. Like, I know the USC thing kind of ended up, you know, in very messy. Yeah. Um, it seems like that's all behind him, and I hope it is, because from a health standpoint, you know, first and foremost. But I mean, he's always been a pretty good coach. He he had some good years at Washington and USC. He he was a really good offensive coordinator under Nick Saban in Alabama, and certainly probably is going to take a lot of, you know, learning tips from the the, the best coach of all time to Texas. And what probably is you know there's a lot of similarities between those two programs mm-hmm. and how they operate and all the resources they have. But it was I I think he has. There is a potential that he, there's something he could do something special at Austin Oof. just because yeah. the, with combined with the talent that he can acquire because it is Texas, mm-hmm. and in combination with his he's just a great brilliant play caller and schematically as an offensive guru. Before today, my gut told me not to like him, you know, just but you get around him today, yeah, he, he knows what he's talking about. He's really sharp, um, and yeah, I think he's good for really good for Texas. He's better than Tom Herman in my opinion. I think they. Uh, you know they're on the right direction for Texas. Um, like you said, they're going to get players. They just need someone to to you know draw up the right plays. Yeah, I mean, and we're saying a lot of good things about a, a lot of teams here. So some of these aren't going to come to fruition. Oh, yeah. Somebody's got to lose. At yeah, some every point. coach is going to. This is the sunshine pumping. Yeah, yeah, day. yeah, yeah. I mean, someone's got to lose. So yeah. some of these good things that we kind of good impressions that we have. Some of it's not going to come to yeah. fruition. Somebody's got to lose. And he, I wouldn't be surprised if Texas did lose. <laughs> you yeah, can't yeah. be surprised when they lose. It seems like, and, and they have, a, and, and obviously it's probably a conversation for a different day. A little bit of a trickier non-conference schedule, kind of like K State. They play Louisiana, yeah. which was one of the better non-conference teams in America yeah. last year. And now they're moving on from their tenth-year quarterback too. Finally, yeah, he's finally gone. <laughs> and they're they're also a team in the Big Twelve that has a quarterback kind yeah. of controversy issue uh-huh. that they don't know who is going to start yet. And Sarkeesian even talked about how he only had 15 practices with them, so he doesn't know. He's probably not going to decide until around the first game. It's still interesting that he's kind of leaving it up for grabs. Not that it shouldn't be. I mean, Casey Thompson and Hudson Carter, the two contenders. Casey Thompson lit it up in the Alamo Bowl (laughs) the last time we saw the Longhorns. He threw for four touchdowns. I remember that. No, he's he's probably the guy they go with, you'd think. it, It might be Hudson Card. I mean that that's kind of what Texas needs is two really good quarterbacks competing for for the job because and that's another place where I think they could use a, a fresh perspective under center because they had um, what's his name again Ellinger 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 well, Ellingsworth yeah. Uh, yeah Ellinger um, he, you know he was you know up and down as well and I think you know he was really good quarterback at times but he still didn't live up to the potential that people set for him he was a, a preseason Big Twelve. Player of the Year, I think, uh, two years ago. 
So that didn't come to fruition, if, if you didn't know. I mean, do you think it really matters who they're going to put under center if they're just going to be giving the ball to Bijan Robinson <laughs> He's half the game anyways? Oh, I mean, and it, it's, it's. I mean, what? what it's a fair point. point. Just I mean, I mean, I think Bijan Robinson. Uh, there's a chance he's better than Brees Hall, in my opinion. He's that good. Um, but in Sarkeesian's offense, it it is going to matter. The quarterback play will matter, um, and he's probably going to produce a really high draft pick as a quarterback at some point. He's just a really good quarterback coach. That's mm-hmm. that's what he did. He did it at Alabama, but you know, I I expect the same thing at Texas. Really, um, Wildcat time, K State time. Yeah, yeah. Chris Kleiman. Obviously, was uh, one of the main events of Media Day. Uh, we we talked to him quite a bit. What what were I just I guess and what's one thing that he said or revealed or described or, or felt or or said you know that that really sticks out to you guys? Like for me, it is probably getting a little bit of more um, clarity on the defensive side of the yeah. ball. Mm-hmm. That's that's where my biggest takeaway is because it is clear that the offense is probably pretty far ahead of the defense at this point. I don't think that really can be debated. Yeah, uh, the defensive lines probably doesn't have the top end talent, doesn't have a Wyatt Hubert mm-hmm. uh, this year, but probably is the bright spot of the defense. Something that they're not concerned with because um, obviously they have quite a bit of good depth there, yeah. even if they don't have the stardom from a season ago. But I, you know, him. Coach Stars could be born this year. Yeah, but Coach Kleiman saying that Cody Fletcher and Daniel Green are essentially his starters. Yeah. He didn't say that in so many words, but you know, he basically you read between the lines all hints and indications were those are the two starters, which isn't a giant surprise. The surprise to me was that it is likely that those two as a tandem, as the ones, will will play more than the ones did last year, which was Elijah Sullivan and Justin Hughes. Because the, I guess the thought for me is that thought and them saying that they're, they're, they like the depth of linebacker, those two things don't make sense together in combination. Because if you like the depth, mm-hmm. then I don't think you'd have to increase the snap load for your, your first string linebackers. That's a good point. And, I mean, it kind of if, – if, if that's the route they go, it kind of shows, too, how much faith do they have in Eric Munoz. And, I mean, that's the thing. I do think Wayne Jones has been talked about good at times. But I, Kleiman did just, you know – uh, didn't mention him today, but you know that's the thing. Is coaches, you know, they talk about so much in one day. So I'm I'm not saying that Wayne Jones can't be a difference maker, but yeah, it's like you said. It seemed like you know Daniel Green and Fletcher will be out there a lot. Yeah, and, and the Wayne Jones thing could obviously be you know an honest accidental oh, om- yeah. omission, and we don't know one way or the other. But it was you know obviously interesting that he was omitted for one reason or another. But it also and. You, you know, we can't really discuss a whole lot of the, the the alignments and formations just because there's not a whole lot of clarity to it. So we'd be pretending to know something that we honestly don't. Mm. But, you know, some of those maybe new roles and new responsibilities and spots that are going to be out there, you wonder if some of it just gets lost in translation because we still hear at times about Wayne Jones playing nickel. So I, I just wonder if some of these positions are kind of just morphing into each other and there's just a little bit of confusion mm-hmm. in terms of the terminology of certain roles. One thing that stuck out to me was that uh, Amaris Brown is working at nickel. I thought it was, everybody just kind of assumed that TJ Smith would be working at nickel a little bit, but now with TJ being fully cleared, uh, Chris Kleiman said that he's going to be working at safety full-time, which is good and bad. I thought that he was probably more suited for the nickel and could change direction better and probably not get ejected as much as <laughs> he could at safety after he was lighting people off in the Texas Tech game. He... he- he he can be a really good safety. That's he why sh- they get like him. Yeah, he sh- yeah <laughs> he sh- show glimpses of that, and, and and with that injury, you know he probably is a little bit less stress. Yeah, being at safety and it, it gives them that because they probably feel good about nickel. Obviously, um, maybe not good. Maybe that was a little too strong a language, but maybe you know better. They feel better at nickel because I think they're going to play Reggie Stubblefield there. It sounds like. Mm-hmm. Um, and then perhaps, and then obviously Amaris Brown. And to be honest, those sound like the two that are going to play there, which is a little bit of a shock that you know Amaris Brown's being thrust in such yeah. a considerable role because it didn't feel that way in the spring. So it's showing that, and I don't think he played much in the spring because of an injury. So that shows that all of a sudden he's doing some things well off the field, doing the right things for them to have as much trust in them as as they indicated this week because yeah. He was the first name actually mentioned when 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 the nickel question was asked, 
and TJ Smith will probably be the backup to Russ East at free safety. And then strong safety is going to be Jerome McPherson, obviously, and there was no, no doubt about that. Who's his backup going to be? I think we all kind of assume maybe it's going to be Sincere Mason, another graduate transfer uh, pickup, mm-hmm. uh, the one from Kennesaw State that, that came in late. But they just – he's been around such a short amount of time. They don't exactly know where he's going to fit. We think safety, but it, it's not a question. Maybe he ends up at nickel mm-hmm. and, you know, and then they move bodies around to make it all fit into the puzzle as well. So. Yeah. I just think that we, we, while we did get a little bit more clarity, um, some of that clarity invites a little bit more questions. I mean, it's the Morris Brown one that's, you know, one that, yeah, like you said, it's kind of a surprise. We didn't know he was going to get thrusted into that role. But the more I think about it, I like it because he is long. Um, you know, he got lost at safety so many times last year that maybe they're looking at him at nickel and seeing, oh, he actually plays this tougher spot better somehow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, he only played the Texas game. That is true. But, man, he was It was rough. Uh, but over. he was true freshman. Yeah, first, true first freshman, action. And it was, yeah, the last game of the season. So uh, you can't, you know, expect him to – it's kind of exciting, I think, that Marcel Brown's getting talked about because it does mean he must be showing up in practice at least. Yeah, I would, I would say yeah. that um, – and that was kind of our thoughts offensively is, is or defensively. Offensively, in terms of things that stood out, the, there's probably a multitude of things. I mean, there's probably more defensive things to even discuss at this point. But, I mean, the fact the, – the, the way they rave about Will Howard, I guess, just can't really be glossed over to the point where it seems like they're going to find ways to get him on the field. Yeah. I mean, it, he has progressed probably more than anyone in the climbing tenure at K-State, the way they talk about him. Um, <laughs> and it's crazy because, yeah, I mean, obviously Skyler is still the guy, but yeah, the way they are talking about him, it wouldn't, it would surprise me not to see Will Howard get the ball, um, for special formations just for him and be able to, you know, uh, throw defense off and still have a guy that can throw it and run it. Yeah. I wouldn't mind Will Howard in like a belldozer type package and take yeah. less hits from Skyler mm-hmm. and try and keep Skyler upright because we've seen Will this summer at the K-State camps and he looks like he's gained like 15 to 20 pounds of muscle and is ready to go and looks in really good shape. Just my only concern with it is sometimes you really throw off the rhythm of your team, um, the chemistry of your team. Yeah. You can really throw things off. Dalton off and Thompson is what Yeah, I just – and I almost don't like it from a drive-by-drive standpoint or at least – but if you're going to do that, I'd rather if a guy just has a few scoring drives, don't take him out just because you're like, oh, I already said I was going to play this guy. Just don't do that. Mm-hmm. So I just hope it doesn't morph into something that's a little bit detrimental um, to an extent. I don't think they will do that, and I do more like it in, I guess, situationally rather than, oh, you get a drive, yeah. and you get a drive, and you get a drive because those are the types of situation scenarios that typically don't work out. And not that Will Howard, um, you know, or yeah, not that Skylar Thompson doesn't want Will Howard to play, but you want to keep Skylar Thompson happy. They're going to keep Skylar Thompson happy. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it does beg the question because yeah, but it, it excites you too. It, it makes you know, okay, they're going to be pretty well set with Will Howard once Skylar moves on. If, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how far Rubley progresses, you know, next year and everything, but. Um, Howard has uh, taken off. And, you know, he's not the only guy that's put on a lot of weight. You know, offensive linemen have too. Like Carver Willis is a guy that, you know, climbing touched on. But it does make me, one of the things that um, was the interesting thing was Kingsley Ugle is more of a wait and see type of guy. Um, They're getting him to develop him, it sounds like, um, into, you know, the tackle that they want. Um, Whereas, you know, at first, when we saw that that addition, we kind of thought maybe they will try to plug him in there, get BB on the inside. But I would probably guess BB starts on the outside. But that was not, you know, for sure. It was talked about. You asked the question, Dy, to climbing. Um, but what do you think about that? It's, it's probably still gonna be Cooper BB yeah. left tackle. It, it it's clear that they, they don't they don't really think that Kingsley Ugu can uh, be ready by that point. He probably just. Well, first, he just played eight or nine games. <laughs> That's true. So yeah. that, like a month ago, almost, it seems like. And then on top of that, he just, he just got there. He dude probably doesn't know the playbook much more than Flando. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that, that, that those invite issues. Yeah. yeah, but I just find it interesting that he thinks that Kingsley might be a redshirt candidate, but Tyrone Howell might not be. That Well, some of that is because 
Yeah, the receivers is still a work in progress, and and I was going to mention this, but we, Shabazz and Taylor's not even ready yet. Yeah. Um. Obviously, he got injured pretty significantly mm-hmm. last game of the season. Expected to make a full recovery, but when that happens is is unknown. Yeah. Just because his injury, the timing of it was so late. He he got he hurt it against Texas last game of the year. Yeah. So he's still not cleared, and they're hoping early August, but that that's hope. At this point, so Ty- it's easy to see why Tyrone yeah. Howell might not redshirt. I mean, it's easy. I mean, if Sebastian Taylor's not ready, the only proven wide receivers on the roster are Malik Knowles and Phillip Brooks. And even that, the only ones. And, and even those, they, they're proven, but they're also still have more to prove. <laughs> yeah. Both Knowles, as, yeah. Knowles, you know, inconsistency mm-hmm. probably mostly due to health, and then Phillip Brooks, you know, he's played banked up quite a bit too, and, and he's almost a little bit of a niche guy. Yeah. Anyway, mm-hmm. there's only so much he can really do with his stature as well. So, I mean, it's clear that there's a it's an unbelievable path for any receiver. That's why they've had so many receivers, even in the high school ranks that they're recruiting for yeah. the 2022 class, be so receptive to their pitches. You know, look, look at our depth chart. Who's yeah. played? Not very many people. So it's a, it's a wide-open depth chart, both for incoming guys right now and yeah. even in 2022. That's why they were in the game for – Moody Rubin, mm-hmm. you know Shaz Nimrod. Um, they're they're they got to get better at receiver. They realize that, and it, and it's easy to find playing time there right now. Yeah, and when you don't have a like a like a scholarship, they're sitting, and you needed to use a blue shirt on someone, and you just took him. You know, late ad. That's kind of a sign that we need someone to fill in. Especially, you know, they took a guy like Cade Warner. Like, that kind of proves that Warner is going to be more probably special teams type player. Yeah. And I will say, the the only the one thing that could happen that we've heard whispers about, and we'll have more content on the site that maybe indicates some of it. But one thing that could really flip the switch for the wide receiver room and turn it into like a, mm, I, I hope they're okay. To man, this could be a really good group, is if the buzz about Keenan Garber and Jalen Travis comes to fruition. Yeah. But right now it's all buzz, and, and and it's still for me too. I said that it's about other teams. So I, I got to be fair and say it's about Kansas State and, and the places that it fits. You got to see it to believe it yeah. with some of them. I mm-hmm. mean, I, he said Travis was the best wide receiver in the spring. Is that did I hear that right? I, 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 I think that's what so, he made yeah. it sound like. Yeah, I think one, uh, maybe one. Yeah, of maybe one ones. of them. But man, he he, it, I think maybe one that took maybe the biggest quantum. Yeah. Leap jump. It's not like there's a ton of. I mean, because Taylor was out, and so it's not like there was a ton of options there. But he did go out of his way to mention Jalen Travis because I'm did. pretty sure it was just about who progressed yep. in the spring, and he mentioned Jalen Travis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and then, but I guess if we're probably going into this thinking that they have three offensive linemen booked in with Noah Johnson, Duffy, and BB. So that, that you're probably looking at the two guard spots up for grabs, probably between three guys, I imagine Josh Revis, Ben Adler. So a poor TA. So not a guarantee that the five starters from last year are the same. Well, it won't be because Katori Levison's probably not going to start. Mm-hmm. But he's someone that they say could play outside and inside. Yeah, and Chris Kleinman made that uh, um, sentiment known between him and BB. Um, and I guess if, if we're going to float it out, just any other things that really stand out, I would, I would guess something that probably needs to be mentioned is – the Julius Brent hype, I mean, it, it's either the biggest hyperbolic thing we've ever had <laughs> or this guy's going to probably can be on an all-Big 12 team at the end of the year. It's one or the other because, I mean, they speak about him, like, top to bottom, anybody around the program, not just the players, not just the coaches, anybody around the program, anybody that's seen him, they speak about him as if he's going in the first round next year. <laughs> like, it's that, like, strong of praise. Skyler Thompson was shocked the first time he saw him. Thought he was a receiver. Probably wished he was a receiver. <laughs> because, you know, uh, he's a freak athlete. He, he's 6'3", long, uh, you know, built, fast. He's got it all. Like, he's all you want in a uh, cornerback. And I really like what they have on the outsides with him, Echo, and even Gardner as another bigger corner um, opposite of Brent's at times. A lot of size, yeah. a lot of length. Lot of yeah, length. that's what Skyler hit on us. He said he hated going up against him <laughs> in practices because he was so long. He was yeah. just a nightmare to I mean, Echo, throw against. Echo's long as heck, yeah. too. Justin Gardner's like 6'3". Yep. I mean, there's, He's pretty long. Yep. There's a lot of size at corner. And then... You know, Mars Brown in there. Mars Brown, like, one of the longest... Like, you look at how I mean, long he's... He played nickel with Stubblefield. I mean... 
there's a lot of unknown and a lot of uncertainty in that secondary. Like we've yeah. never seen Sincere Mason play. Yeah. We've never seen yeah. Reggie Stubblefield play. We've seen Amaris Brown play for like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we've seen T. Denson play for like ten minutes. Um, haven't seen Brents play. I mean, we, yeah, we've we never have, seen we, Brents play. We haven't, we haven't seen Julius Brents play Kansas State. And, nope. and at Iowa, he he didn't play a whole lot yet either. And then Russ Yeast is, is the one that's probably played the most, and that was at Louisville. Yeah. Yeast and McPherson. Obviously, McPherson's played play a lot. Echo played a lot last year. While there there is a like a narrow path, you used to really squint your eyes and look. It's like, man, this secondary could be – better than we've seen the last two, three years, the best mm-hmm. one that Chris Clemens assembled. But then there's also, you, you can twitch your eyes and be like, this thing could come crumbling down pretty quick too because we're making a lot of assumptions off things we haven't seen yet. Yeah, it's like, I mean, I, that's the thing. is You got you, you know the coaches do their vetting and everything else, but if, we, if we're if we having trouble finding tape on guys, <laughs> I mean, you know you get the tape, but still, like, at the end of the day, like, it's, it, it's very unknowns. I, even the coaches are probably... Wondering how this is all going to work out, but the one thing I think they know is um, Brent's. No matter what's going to work out, like I think they know that for sure. Everyone else is more of a uh, who knows. Yeah, and I, and I think they almost feel that way right now about Timothy Horn. Oh yeah, Horn. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay, because you you almost it's not at the same level as Julius Brent's. Is that that thing is you yeah. know left the station? <laughs> it's the size of a school bus now, mm-hmm. but Horn himself is the size of a school bus, <laughs> but. <laughs> While not on the same level as Brent, it's not far off. There, There's a lot of belief that he's going to be a difference maker. There's some that say he could duplicate or just be just as good as Drew Wiley. Um, I hope they're right because that's saying something. Wiley was dominant. Like when we say, yeah, like we talk about him as a defensive star for a reason. Like he <laughs> he really made plays. And, and now they're at tackle with him and Jalen Pickle coming into his own. And Huggins is a guy, you know, that has played a little bit. I really like the way DT is looking. Yeah, I, I I like it for I'm concerned for defensive tackle beyond the 2021 season. Yeah, but for this mm-hmm. season, I I think they got enough, I, and they do need Jalen Pickle to take that next step because, like, as much as they're talking about Timothy Horn, and I want this to be true, we don't know it to be true, and we, and he has to translate it to the field first. But Jalen Pickle might look the best of any defensive tackle they have on the roster. Like, yeah. he looks like a guy, you tell me, hey, that guy plays for Auburn. I'm like, yeah, he yeah. looks like a guy that plays for Auburn, right? <laughs> so, just, the, you know, the, the, the those mammoth SEC defensive tackles, Jalen Pickle looks like that. And that's what they're going for. Obviously, they got Timmy Horn and now Jalen Pickle. Huggins isn't as big as them, but, but you have your two big nose tackles like that. You know, they're not as big as some out there, but they are, for, for college football, yeah, they're pretty big. Yeah, it almost feels like they feel like they can replace Horn fairly well like they're not worried or Wiley Wiley yeah they're not really worried about replacing Wiley doesn't seem yeah I don't really get that and I feel like with um, impression at the end I feel like they feel the same way about Hubert uh, because not, I don't think they, I, I, I don't get that as much that's yeah. what I was going to say I think they feel much better about replacing Wiley than they do Hubert I think they feel like they have a, enough players at the edge that they're going to have guys fresh throughout yeah. the entire game I don't think they have anyone that can come maybe close to some of the, the star power pass rushing yeah. acumen that White Hubert had. Obviously, he would. Yeah, I know he would take himself out of some plays too and be inconsistent at times last year. I get it, but in terms of just pass rushing skill, like I don't think there's anyone on the roster right now that can match Hub- Hubert's skill by the time that he left K State. Like I think there's a couple that could reach that they're not, not this year I, but yeah but not this year this year would be a stretch and obviously mm-hmm. i'm talking about still Khalid duke That's he needs guy, to yeah. get back on track but the guy with the, maybe the most uh, 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 upside in my opinion is probably felix on dk but there's also someone that will tell you it's name matlack yeah and yeah. he's he might be even a little further out because he's so raw but freak athlete. still thin yeah. still thin yeah yep. so he needs a little bit more bulk mm-hmm. but i i'm i'm a i Speaking of end, continuing on end, I'm a fan of Boo Massey. I don't think he's going to be Hubert, obviously. He can't be. He's not, like you said, um, no one on this team has Hubert's skill. Mm-hmm. At least not yet. Like, I think Duke and um, Anna Duke could get there at some point. But I still think Boom, full-time Boom, could be a lot of fun to see as well. He's so He is so big. He is, I think, someone that's going to complement the big tackles inside really well. And they're going to be able to, I think, still at least contain the quarterback pretty well. 
Yeah, I think all three of them could be solid enough where it doesn't matter that they don't have the star. Because they, if all three of them can get around like two and a half to three sacks a piece, mm -hmm. I'd say that's a solid season for all three of them. And Boom looked the best, I think, that we've seen him his entire K-State career last year. He looked fresh. He wasn't banged up. He was honestly one of K-State's best players and at times was better than Hubert. Yeah, I think that's a fair. He was really good. Uh, I think we wrap it up. Unless you, any roster stuff I'm missing that uh, maybe stood out. Yeah, Kleiman uh, talked really highly of Daniel Yamatorbebe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then he also talked quite highly about Sammy Wheeler as well, even though he's dealt with yeah, he injury and stuff in the past. But, yeah, those, those two specifically were the two the two tight ends that I think he talked about the most. And I, and I don't even know if it's – because the injuries were so different and so uh, – such a – almost freak accident both times, but it's crazy. Sammy Wheeler has had, like, his injury his season cut short like multiple times yeah, already yeah. in his young career. Mm -hmm. he, he switched from a quarterback. He's had an interesting path yeah. already. Um, and then they have a chance, though, with him and, and Matterbebe to have a solid one-two threat there at, at yeah. tight end, and that could maybe alleviate some of the stress on the receivers, take away some of the stress from receivers. Uh, and you're probably going to get some favorable matchups for with your tight ends and receivers because people are going to compensate for Deuce Vaughn. I guess that makes me think. All I, don't, I know you guys might want to touch on the tight ends a little bit more, but it also makes me uh, remember that Kleiman did have. You know, he was asked about, "Hey, what? How do you feel at running back beyond Deuce Vaughn?" Yeah. And the first guy he mentioned was Jacardi Wright, which you know, now that Keon moosey has gone, Harry Trotter's gone, Tyler Burns gone, maybe there's not really any other options, mm -hmm. but uh, he, he really praised him for the first time in a genuine leave, you know, like this guy is on the right track for the first, it seems like for the first time in quite a while. Yeah. So I think, I think that one's maybe headed in the right direction. Um, you get, and he, think, cause he even said, I, Chris Klein even said about Jacardi that he's going to be, you know, a critical player for us, a, a, you know, an important player for us, an important piece to the puzzle mm -hmm. for us. So he's going to get his snaps. He's going to get his carries if, if that's, if what Kleiman shared at B12 Media Days is any any indication. The second guy he mentioned was Joe Irvin, obviously opted out a season ago, so he's been away from the program for a little bit. I think he was pretty rusty in the spring of first, but I think the light came back on. And, and at the end, by the time he was finishing, you know, saying what he liked about Joe Irvin, it almost seemed like, well, he did mention Jacardi right first, but the, he might have been even more glowing yeah. of Joe Irvin at the end of the mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. At least that's what it felt to me. It was huge that they even got him back. And I should point out, I mean, we don't talk about Joe Hall often, but Kleiman pointed out that Joe Hall was the one that kept in contact with him during the opt-out year and was big in, you know, getting him back. So Skyler raved about Joe Irvin, too, yeah. right? right? Yep. So it was more about, hey, this guy's not a kid anymore. He, yep. came, he came back to Manhattan kind of like a grown-ass man all of a sudden. So mm -hmm. that's probably a good thing. We could, I guess the... We kind of hit on all the roster notes, personnel notes, probably. Last thing I want to say on tight end, I wanted to get back to that is because yeah. you mentioned the Wheeler health, Bebe's health is huge too because he's had you know a yeah. myriad of injuries throughout his career, and then even behind them, Leonard's too. Like the whole tight end, they've situation, all lost seasons. It's the whole tight end situation. You know, if they stay healthy, could be really good. But wouldn't be surprised to see you know. One of them get dinged up <laughs> here or there. Yeah, Connor Fox wasn't mentioned. Oh, yeah. but he I, was mentioned, actually. Okay, but I imagine that mm -hmm. he's going to come into the equation yeah. at least a little bit um, and start to see this first signs of life maybe as a, a, a competent contributor for mm -hmm. Kansas State. I think the final thing to maybe touch on, because obviously it's dominated the college football sports, college sports landscape, and kind of the conversation since July 1st. It was name, image, and likeness, obviously. Yeah. Uh, players and coaches were just peppered with that over and over and over again. Uh, Chris Kleiman, you That's know, why couldn't even learn about the team. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, Chris Cle Chris Kleiman, you know, used it, his time at the podium to say, "Hey, Manhattan's a home run for name, image, and likeness. Yeah. Um, we're, you know, you're it's a gold mine. We're the main event. That there's nothing else. You know, we we dominate the story. We dominate the headlines. We're the we're the biggest story in town. Them and Goolsby's. Yeah, <laughs> so." <laughs> <laughs> Which I think that was the he hit the right tunes. I think yeah. I think that's what they're also selling at the recruiting um, level as well. When when they invite prospects into town for yeah. visits, I think that's part of the pitch. So it was interesting to hear Chris Kleiman say that on the podium because I think that's what prospects are 
seeing and hearing when when they take trips to Manhattan and did so throughout the uh, the, oh, month, yeah. the month of June. Um, Gundy's was interesting on name, image, image, and likeness. I mean, I guess you know we all varied in how much we paid attention to certain coaches, and Gundy was one that you know I paid you know heavy attention to, and he he made it seem like he was more lackadaisical about name, image, and likeness, and like yeah, I don't even. You know, it's not even a part of my my daily thing. It actually, Kleiman said the same thing at one point. Yeah, well, it's not they're, even they're a part not allowed. of the coach's daily yeah, they're thing. Not, they're, they're not supposed to be exactly. tied to it. Because that's been, compliance. It's a whole compliance mm-hmm. issue. So I, I think they can sell it on the recruiting trail, yeah. obviously. Oh, but yeah. but that, I think that's as far as it goes. I don't think they're the ones. They certainly don't have the time anyway to arrange some of the deals and, and oh, yeah. no, that's stuff, exactly. stuff like that. That's what's but, funny that they even get asked about some of that stuff because it's like, they, they, How much can they even talk but, about? Yeah, well, I think they could talk about it, but I, they don't know anything. And that's my point: is how much mo- like they good no, substance can they yeah, actually give us? Like zero. Power. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they're they're shooting like in the dark, just like we are. You yeah, know? They, I mean, and, and everyone's kind of guessing yeah. at this point. And the ones that they claim to know, they're they're pretending. Yeah. So it, it's yeah. where it's still all mystery of how it's all going to unfold. They. You know, Jerron McPherson was asked repetitively, actually, multiple times, you know, you got anything cooking up? And he's like, I'm staying out of it, just oh, watching. Yeah. He's like, I, I th- it was almost if you, like, listen to some of his answers, because he had to answer, like, four or five times. He was like, I'm going to let everyone else make the mistakes first. Because yeah. he's mm-hmm. like, obviously, there's going to be mistakes made. Things are going to happen. Some people are going to get the wrong end of the stick. I don't want to be that guy. Yep. And, <laughs> so, he's, and he also, yeah. Somebody's got to get him a fashion deal after what he <laughs> wore yesterday. He would pro- probably best outfit out, out of anybody at Media Day, besides maybe Flando yesterday. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. With the white pants and the KSO sh- uh, polo, of course, that's the best best shirt of the day. But And the leopard shirt. Oh, yeah, the leopard shirt. I should have <laughs> wore that into the, the stadium. Yeah. And had Jerry Jones getting hot and bothered. <laughs> Oh, good, good note to end on. Yeah, take us home, go. Big Daddy. Tell your friends, baby. 